you doing today? Pretty good. Located okay, bass fish here? Sure it is, but why do you ask? Back where I'm from, some of the bass that have been caught have high levels of mercury in them. We advise to catch and release and not to eat them. Well, we have some mercury in the water, but not at unhealthy levels. Let me show you some good fishing spots on the map. Sounds good. Mercury in the water? I went swimming here just last week. Shouldn't there be warning signs about that kind of thing? Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Is the water around here safe? There he goes. Let's ask Greg. Hey, Greg, what's this about mercury in the water? We don't have factories dumping mercury in the bayous. True, but officials still test for mercury levels because mercury released into the air can travel for miles and be absorbed at a later time in different bodies of water. They've actually found mercury in the blood of penguins in Antarctica, and you know there isn't much industry there. The concern over mercury in fish is because of bioaccumulation and biomagnification, two important concepts in our environment. Mercury is an element that can be stored in the fatty tissue of animals such as fish and build up over time. We keep an eye on bass because they're pretty much at the top of the bayou food chain. Now look at how mercury moves through that chain. First, bacteria transforms inorganic mercury into methylmercury, an organic form of mercury that's readily absorbed by living things like plankton at the bottom of the food chain. Tadpoles eat the plankton or bugs contaminated with the methylmercury. Then small fish eat the tadpoles. But a small fish doesn't eat just one tadpole. It may eat several over time. The methylmercury is stored in the tissues of fish, so as it continues to eat mercury-laden tadpoles, its mercury levels rise. That's what's known as bioaccumulation. Now, a fish higher in the food chain, like a bass, comes along and eats not just one small fish, but dozens of small fish over time. The methylmercury accumulates and remains in the fish even as it gets older. Over time, the bass's methylmercury levels will exceed the methylmercury levels of organisms lower in the food chain. That's known as biomagnification. That means that if I had the mercury-packed bass, I would store the mercury? Exactly. And over time, if you ate more than one bass, with each new fish, your body's mercury level would rise. Bioaccumulation. I have an aunt who says you can overdo vitamins for the same reason. That's right. Vitamins that are fat soluble, like vitamins D, K, and E, get stored. And if you take too many, they can actually make you sick. Mercury's not the only bioaccumulating headliner. You're heading to New York State, where the Hudson River has an environmental headache, and it has PCB written all over it. PCB stands for polychlorinated biphenyl, an oily man-made substance that doesn't burn easily. Since it's also a good insulator, it became popular in electrical equipment starting in the 1930s. General Electric, a leader in electronic manufacturing, was among the first to use PCBs in electrical capacitors and transformers manufactured at its Hudson Falls and Fort Edwards plant in New York. Over time, through legally discharged wastewater and seepage from beneath the plant, the PCBs found their way into the Hudson River and ultimately the food chain. PCBs themselves are not readily water soluble, but they do dissolve enough that they get into the food chain, whether it be through the phytoplankton and the other invertebrates, and then eventually to the fish or directly from the water column into the fish. PCBs are lipophilic, that is, they dissolve in fat and they end up in the fatty tissue of the animal. So the more fat an animal has, generally the higher the PCB content they have. By the 1970s, PCBs were suspected of having harmful effects on human health and were banned by the EPA in 1979. Even though GE had stopped using them in 1977, an estimated 1.3 million pounds had already made it into the river. Contamination in the river poses risks uh, to a number of organisms, uh, including the fish themselves and any of the consumers of those fish, birds, uh, other forms of wildlife, and of course humans. And that's one reason why we have the fish consumption advisories in place for the entire Hudson River. People who fish for recreation have to release the fish they catch in some areas and pregnant women and young children are warned not to eat the fish from the Hudson River. Commercial fishing has even been stopped in certain parts of the river. 
To monitor the PCB problem, fish samples are taken regularly from the river and sent for analysis to determine how much PCB they contain. Acceptable levels of PCBs in fish have been set by the Food and Drug Administration at two parts per million. A good handle on that is, if you think in terms of time, one minute in two years would be one part per million. Concentration levels vary depending upon the type of fish and how close they are to the source. Up closer to the capacitor plant sites, you will see characteristically two or three hundred parts per million in a fatty species of fish. And lower down in the system, in those same species, you only see five or six parts per million. Even though PCB levels in Hudson River fish have dropped substantially since the 1970s, the EPA has determined that PCBs don't biodegrade and has decided to dredge a 40-mile stretch of the Hudson River where levels are the highest. The project has essentially has identified about two and a half million cubic yards of contaminated sediment that has been deposited over time, which needs to come out of the system. Enough dirt will be dredged to fill 10 football fields each, 14 stories tall. The project will take five years and cost GE about $460 million. One of the concerns over dredging is the potential for stirring up PCBs already buried, causing them to travel further downstream, creating more problems. To attempt to avoid this, equipment like silt curtains will be used to help contain resuspended sediments. General Electric and others feel that the resuspension risks are too great and that the river will continue to naturally bury the contaminated sediments. They also point out the disruption to the fish and aquatic habitat that dredging will create. Summer scholar students at Marist College, located alongside the Hudson River, studied both sides of the dredging debate in 2001. The assignment was to find the positive and negative effects of dredging and to come together and make this website. There are two groups, and it was multimedia and uh, video. In multimedia, we actually worked on the website. We put together like all the information we've collected by interviewing different people and things that we looked up by ourselves and researched. When you're reporting on a controversial topic, you have to remain neutral so as to show both points of the situation and not choose one. And we made sure that there were roughly an even amount of interviewers that would take both sides for everyone we interviewed for dredging it, we would try and make sure that there was a counterpart for not dredging it. I learned a lot about dredging. I learned uh, the extreme cost it would take and the damage it would do to GE uh, to dredge, but I also learned that the damage it was doing to the river now is uh, quite extensive, and that something needs to be done about it, and waiting uh, would probably not be the best course of action. No matter what's the best solution for removing PCBs, the issue will continue to be an aggravation on the Hudson. America's national symbol, the bald eagle, neared extinction decades ago, but is now back thanks to the efforts of preservation centers like the George M. Sutton Avian Research Center in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. One of the suspected threats to the eagle surfaced in the 1950s. It all goes back to an insecticide called DDT, which in 1940 was hailed as a magic bullet when it was introduced to the market for use against insects carrying diseases like malaria. DDT was immediately popular around the globe. In Taiwan alone, malaria cases fell from one million to only nine after 25 years of use. DDT was also widely applied to crops for pest control since it doesn't dissolve in the rain it persisted in the environment. It was only in 1944 when traces of DDT started showing up in human fat storage that experts grew concerned. Several years later, DDT was detected in the milk of nursing mothers, and then it was subject to massive research. DDT was found to be accumulating in eagles also, and by the 1950s, naturalists reported a decline in eagle populations that they blamed on the chemical. They theorized that DDT reduced the amount of calcium in the eagle's eggshells, creating eggs that often broke during incubation. DDT had bioaccumulated in eagles by traveling up their food chain. 
DDT residue from agricultural runoff, contaminated water, river sediment, and the plankton living there. As smaller fish fed on the plankton and DDT-laced water, their concentration of the chemical increased. Larger fish, like trout, fed on the smaller fish, and over time, their levels also grew. At the top of the food chain, the bald eagle's steady diet of tainted fish produced levels of DDT up to 10 million times the levels found in the water. To increase bald eagle numbers, scientists at the Sutton Avian Research Center transferred eggs from nests in Florida, incubated and hatched them, then raised the eagles, eventually releasing over 300 eagles throughout five states. The bald eagle was not the only bird affected by DDT. The osprey, another fish-eating raptor, saw its numbers decline. And the brown pelican, the state bird of Louisiana, may have been driven to near extinction because of the same soft eggshell issue. Even though it was never proven to be harmful to humans, in 1973, DDT was banned from production in the U.S. and several bird populations increased. Since DDT substitutes can cost up to 23 times more, controversy over its use still exists in poorer countries battling malaria and other insect-borne diseases. Here's the Tackle Box Brain Teaser for you. During World War II, which of the following chemicals did soldiers use to control body lice and prevent the spread of deadly disease? A. Gasoline B. DDT C. Lime or D. PCB. Pollutants that persist and bioaccumulate became the focus of the United Nations in 2001 when members of 122 countries came together to phase out POP's Terrible 12. POP's is an acronym for Persistent Organic Pollutants. As the name implies, these compounds tend to persist in the environment for long periods of time, many years in fact they will tend to accumulate in the fat tissues of animals, including mammals and therefore humans. And since they're very toxic, will cause long-term problems for humans. Chemically, what makes them so persistent is that they're very stable compounds. POPs don't dissolve well in water, and they tend not to biodegrade. They can also vaporize in the sun and be carried and deposited far from their original location creating problems in places they're not even used. The Terrible 12 are a group of POPs designated by the United Nations as compounds that we need to get rid of. Some are pesticides and herbicides, some are manufacturing type compounds, others are byproducts of manufacturing. POPs are highly effective compounds for what they were designed for. The problem is the toxicity to humans in the long run. Not all persistent pollutants are produced in factories. Take the case of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. PAHs can be formed through natural combustion processes, such as forest fires. In recent decades, though, we've increased the concentration of PAHs due to combustion processes, such as the burning of fossil fuel. While PAHs haven't been banned, they do persist in river sediments and are thought to negatively affect the health of aquatic organisms, impacting our waterways each time we leave our driveway. Most of us are sort of pointing a finger at the factory down the road that's spewing out lots of CO2 and other contaminants from its smokestacks, but all of us are actually contributing to the problem every day when we drive our cars. Scientists estimate that you're carrying about 250 new chemicals in your body today that did not exist prior to 1945. Holy mackerel! As persistent pollutants have been phased out, new pesticides have blossomed. We'll get our phosphates and carbamates are a chemical group of insecticides that uh, have in large measure replaced the old chlorinated hydrocarbons, which were those persistent organic molecules. Organophosphates and carbamates are not as persistent in the environment as the old chlorinated hydrocarbons were. They are rapidly broken down by sunlight. They do not stay in the soil, they don't stay in the water, they do not accumulate anywhere because they're so rapidly broken down. Products that use natural insecticides like pyrethrin, derived from chrysanthemum flowers, 
also offer safer ways for controlling pests. And the answer to the tackle box brain teaser is B. During World War II, soldiers in the trenches were routinely issued canisters of DDT to sprinkle on their bodies to control lice and prevent the spread of deadly disease. While traditional farms still use pesticides, the threat of bioaccumulation has changed the way some farmers raise crops. Organic farming is raising crops like this citrus without using pesticides or herbicides or fungicides, miticides. Instead, we build into the tree the ability to withstand pests and produce a quality product. The basic idea behind organic gardening or farming is to enrich the soil, and so we use many practices to add to the soil, such as incorporating crop residues, cover crops, uh, using compost. We put compost down. Orchard this size with 15 acres, we put 50,000 pounds of compost down. And so we've developed a very rich soil. And this soil is loaded with fungi and bacteria and earthworms. In a conventional orchard, you destroyed all of that because the first pesticide you use pretty much destroys the earthworms. In our garden, we use very little pesticides. We have plants that attract the beneficial insects. We also have plants that repel certain insects. We encourage ladybugs to grow in the garden to feed on aphids. We buy insects that are predator insects, and these predator insects, of course, uh, we release them and they eventually catch up and maintain a control. We're uh, way ahead of the game, because if we wait till that insect is all over, it's too late. The demand for organic produce and products has been increasing every year. Only those items grown by farmers who follow the U.S. Department of Agriculture strict standards can be labeled certified organic. When you purchase organic grown fruits or vegetables, you're getting a farmer who's willing to stand behind that product and say, look, I can guarantee you that I have no pesticide, herbicide, fungicides, miticides in this product. Who's monitoring the farmer who's using pesticide? Is someone checking that fruit? Is someone checking that produce? Not like they are with us. Gee, I never realized my body automatically stores some chemicals that may not be good for me. Yeah, in fact, POPs grab hold of fat molecules. Tell you what, now that I know levels can build up over time, I'm going to pay a lot closer attention to warning signs about contamination. Why not make a survey of your home or school? Find out what kind of toxic chemicals are present and are they being stored safely. Also, keep in mind that even though the terrible 12 of POPs have been outlawed, they're still in the environment for years after they were placed there still giving you reasons to think about bioaccumulation. So, who's up for some bass fishing? Count me in. Oh yeah, me too. After all this talk about fat storage, I could use a workout. Great. Let's look for a place for lunch. Yes, and over. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I didn't know that. That's new to me. Keep going. <laughs> Welcome to the summer show. <laughs> yeah, you wish. Okay. <laughs> POPs grab hold to fat molecules. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Wow. <laughs> Visit our Tackle Box website to learn more.